All right. So it looks like we had, um, we've got a good group here. So we'll go ahead and um, get started. Uh, I do have the chat box open. So please feel free to use the chat box for questions. Um, and uh, we'll leave some time for questions afterwards as well. All right, so our topic today is sustainable eating. So what does sustainable mean? What does sustainable eating mean? So sustainable means um, able to be maintained at a certain rate or level or able to be upheld or defended. So what does that mean when it comes to sustainable eating? Well, really there is no official definition of what sustainable eating is, where you know things like organic um, are, is a legal term, um, sustainable and sustainable eating is not necessarily a legal term, but it's basically about choosing foods that are helpful to our environment and to our bodies. Um, it's also humane for workers, humane for animals, promotes fair wages, improves the community somehow, um, you know, some, some certifications are out there like fair trade certified, um, but the, you know, overall there is no legal definition to sustainable eating. Typically when we talk about sustainable eating, we talk a lot about what is the impact of what we eat on the environment. And depending on what we eat, it can have a huge impact difference in the impact. Um, so here is the carbon footprint of what we eat, and it's the calculations of greenhouse gas emissions from the production, processing, and transportation of different food items. Um, and it, um, you know, you can see there that the impact of something like beef and lamb, which, you know, is conventionally raised, you know, kind of feedlot raised, has a much bigger impact than something like tomatoes or beans or broccoli, nuts. Um, surprisingly, milk was lo lower down on the environmental impact, which I was surprised to see. Um, but peanut butter, um, you know, and then so on and so forth. And then of course, you know, not surprising, pork and turkey and salmon are going to be f further up. You know, it is complex though. There was a new study published in 2018, well, fairly new, right? a couple of years old now, but it basically looked at a review of 570 studies published over the last 20 years. The impact of land use, freshwater use, water pollution, air pollution, greenhouse gas emissions. And what they found was that the same foods can have huge differences um, depending on how it's grown, where it's grown, things like rice and tomatoes. Rice, depending on how it's grown, can have a major environmental impact um, because it uses a lot of water. Um, they did find that high impact beef, meaning the type of beef that was feedlot raised or that you had to clear land um, to raise it, had 12 times the emissions and 50 times the land use of sustainably raised beef. Um, and so what a big difference, right? A 50 times of a difference of land use and 12 times the difference of emissions. So that's, that's kind of huge. And that would, you know, take the beef here that's all the way at the end and maybe move it more towards the middle or even towards, towards the end. You know, some other complex issues to think about is that, you know, as, as we promote plant-based eating, which, you know, in general has a lot less of an environmental impact than, you know, conventionally raised beef. Um, but, you know, a lo lot of the things that, that we may not even stop to think about, for example, almond farms use incredible amounts of water. Typically, almonds are also grown in places where water might be a little bit more scarce to begin with. And then they're using all this water to make all the almond milk. Um, and, you know, I myself, I do love almond milk and I love almond flour, but cook a lot with it. But, uh, you know, it's, it's not just always as cut and dry. Soy is usually monocropped. 
Um, a lot of times soy is G grown with uh, GMO soy. Uh, and many of these crops potentially may need to travel thousands of miles. So it's, it's not always so cut and dry. But typically we know in general that eating a more plant-based diet as we saw from the chart there can have less of an environmental impact, right? And so what are some of the more typical plant-based diets that you might see? Uh, you might see a Mediterranean diet and we know the Mediterranean diet is strongly, strongly correlated with better health outcomes, less risk of chronic disease, um, less risk of dementia, um, depression, anxiety. Uh, a lot of other diets too, you know, the traditional Asian diet has been, you know, strongly correlated with a long lifespan. Um, the engine number two diet, which is a type of vegan diet. And of course we, we have the typical traditional vegetarian diet, the, the orange diet. Um, so these would all kind of be different variations of a plant-based diet. So, okay. Um, so whole plant food, whole food plant-based basics. So why do I say whole food? Good question, right? What's what's the difference with you know just being plant based versus whole food plant based? Well, plant based, depending on how you do it, can potentially be an extremely healthy diet, or it can be an unhealthy diet as well. You know, right? If we're eating a lot of really highly processed foods, um, I had a friend in college who was vegan at the time and, um, you know, her vegan diet consisted of, you know, French fries, Oreos and, uh, lots of vodka and, you know, not such the, the healthy vegan diet, but with the whole food plant-based basics, we're cutting out a lot of the ultra processed foods and putting these whole foods, um, at the center. So starches, whole grains, fruits, and veggies, um, the nice thing about this, this way of eating is that you'll likely eat more food, not less, right? And making sure that you're focusing on pleasure and there's so many plant-based foods that are, that are delicious, right? Um, doing a, a veg, vegetarian chili, um, whole grain pasta, tacos, stir fries, all of these can, can be um, wonderfully plant-based. Now there is no food math required, meaning, um, you know, when you're eating these whole food pl plant-based, you're not always having to calculate how many calories did I have, so on and so forth. But there are some things that you do want to pay attention to if you're 100% plant-based that you do need to supplement with if you are 100% plant-based and vegan. Um, go ahead and put it in the chat box if anyone knows what the main vitamin that you need to supplement with if, if you are 100% plant-based. Uh, so let's see, we'll, we'll see uh, in the chat box what everyone says. All right, so a whole foods plant-based nutrition is lots of leafy vegetables, um, legumes, pulses, legumes and pulses are basically beans, right? Lentils, black beans, kidney beans, whole grains like quinoa, nuts and seeds, herbs and spices, and then a lot less of any type of animal food, but you'll also see less refined sugar, ideally less refined flour, less you know, refined oils and margarines and using um, a, a higher quality type of oil. Okay, so where do you find plant-based recipes? Uh, lots of different great sources for recipes. Um, check out your local library. There's the Forks Over Knives cookbook, um, the How Not to Die <laughs> cookbook. I know it's a little bit of a name, right? Um, but this is written by Dr. Greger and he's a strong advocate of plant-based eating. And um, he, he is great in terms of uh, really of an interesting writer. Um, a lot of research studies that he, um, you know, mentions. And so I, I do like his book. 
vegan for everybody. This is put out by America's Test Kitchen. So America's Test Kitchen always has really well-developed um, recipes, you know, on the internet. Minimalist Baker has a lot of plant-based recipes. It's not 100% plant-based, um, but, you know, mostly forks over knives, Oshi Glows, picklesandhoney.com, Sprouted Kitchen. So a lot of different options for um, plant-based recipes. Um, okay, so how do you make the change? And once again, you know, you don't necessarily need to all of a sudden be 100% plant-based. Um, you know, you can still be an omnivore, but maybe you kind of make the change a little bit over to kind of exploring some more plant-based meals. So maybe you do something like Meatless Mondays. And Meatless Mondays, um, you know, just means that you don't eat any um, animal foods on Mondays. Uh, maybe you make meet the flavoring of the dinner, not the star. Um, VB6 is also another good cookbook. Cookbook. This is written by Mark Bittman. And Mark Bittman is a New York Times restaurant critic. Um, and he, um, you know, had to go out to eat a lot, but he's like, oh my gosh, you know, my health is suffering. I need to make some changes, but how can I be a restaurant critic and not eat any meat if I'm going to all these different restaurants? And so he decided to be vegan before six o'clock. And um, so the that's his cookbook with a lot of um, more vegan recipes. It's not all or nothing, right? And so plant-based can be 100% plants or it can be, um, you know, maybe just vegan Mondays and maybe VB6. So it's kind of, you know, what works for you and also what works for your health. Um, and, you know, making sure maybe you're finding that, yeah, I do feel better with a little bit of meat. I do feel better if I eat fish maybe once or twice a week. So understanding what works for you, what works with your cultural traditions, what works with the rest of your family. It's, this is more about how can I start to move over towards having less of an environmental impact. Uh, here I'm seeing another Somebody said um, that the Colin Cooks Vegan is um, a great website as well. Oh, so thank you. I'll have to check that out. So in terms of my question on vitamins, I see some here. Um, so a lot of people put in the chat box about vitamins. And so I wanted to say that yes, some of the things that you do need to think about are omega-3 fatty acids. So omega-3 fatty acids you find in different things, um, mainly in fatty fish as the EPA and the DHA that our body uses. Things like chia seeds, um, flax seeds have alpha linolenic acid, which then needs to be converted. So a lot of people who are 100% vegan do find that if they take an algae supplement, <clears throat> that has the DHA, that that works for them. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, so the two things that, the two um, nutrients that vegans tend to get a lot of and do very well with, um, and vegetarians too, is magnesium and folate. And folate is really important for our brain. It's, it's important for neural development. Magnesium also is really important for so many different things in our body, including um, sleeping well. Um, and so, you know, if you're a vegan, you're most likely going to get plenty of magnesium, plenty of folate. But as people said here in the chat box, it is 100%, it is if you are vegan, and 100% vegan, or even, you know, mostly vegan, you need to supplement with B12. That is, no one is arguing that, right? Um, and so, and you need more than the RDA too. You need about um, at least, if you're not going to take a, a supplement, you need to at least get three types of supplemented, three different supplemented foods, you know, at each meal that you get something supplemented with B12, more 
than 200% of the RDA for, for B12. Um, you don't absorb as much from supplements and that's why that you need to get so much more than the RDA um, when you're getting it from, from, from the, uh, you know, the, the type of B12 that's not found right in foods. Um, so somebody else here said B vitamins. Um, you know, the other B vitamin that would be possibly in question would be B6. B6 is also critical for different things, um, including brain health um, and really for actually forming a lot of neurotransmitters. So serotonin, dopamine formation are both dependent on B6 um, as well as iron. So iron also is um, something that, that you do need to pay attention to your iron status if you are 100% vegan as well. Um, oh, and then one more thing, somebody here said, I really like the Korean vegan. Oh yeah, I like the Korean vegan too, she's great. Um, I follow her on Instagram and um, you know, she just has such a nice way about her and tells a lot of really nice stories in addition to um, uh, her, her cooking. And I think she just has a new cookbook out too. Um, that's been very popular. I think it's like on Amazon, one of the Amazon best 10 seller list now. Um, so that's a, that's a great option as well. Um, adding in some beans, making sure that you're getting in adequate protein is essential as well when you're going a little bit more plant-based. So as dietitians, we always say beans and greens, beans and greens. When people ask us, what, what, what should I eat? We say beans and greens because they are both so incredibly healthy. Um, so beans are high in protein. They're amazing for your gut microbiome. If you're using an instant pot, you don't necessarily need to soak the beans. Um, if you are finding that they do bother your stomach a little bit, then you make, make sure that 100% you would want to soak them. Um, lentils do not need to be soaked and they cook fairly quickly too, which is nice. You can also use canned beans. Um, and, and, and you know, you don't have to have an instant pot. You can just cook beans on the stove as, as well. Um, I like cooking them in the instant pot because I feel like they get um, really nice and soft and creamy. Um, so the other thing to think about is organic fruits and vegetables. You know, maybe you uh, add some more of those in as your um, wallet allows. You know, they, uh, they use a little bit more crop rotation, more composting, more mechanical weeding rather than relying on just, um, you know, pesticides. Um, and they use biological pest control. Um, I, I, any, I don't know if anyone is close to Wilson Farms. I, if you do like the Wilson Farms CSA, they use something they call integrated pest management. So while they are not organic, and if you do the CSA, it's not organic, but they, um, they try to, between the crop rotations and um, the mechanical weeding and, and you know trying to plant different plants together, um, they, they manage these pests without having to use fertilizers, but it's very expensive to be um, certified as truly organic because it is, that is a legal term, right? So not in organic foods would be artificial fertilizers, synthetic pesticides, GMOs, growth regulators. Um, this would, you know, referring to animals, um, artificial feed additives, antibiotics for animals, other than what they need. Um, so as we look to, you know, we have all the rise of all these superbugs um, because not so much, you know, of the antibiotics that people take, but really, you know, these superbugs that are resistant to antibiotics is mainly because of all the antibiotics that are used in animal feed. So if you are going to include some animal products, you know, when you're buying organic, if you're you know, budget will allow, at least you're cutting down on some of that non-essential antibiotic use. All right, so what's maybe the difference between organic and sustainable? So we have to remember, you know, when we talk about organic, we kind of think of this quaint little farm, you know, maybe our local CSA. Organic farms, even though they're technically organic, they're almost sometimes run as kind of these big monocrop farms as well. Sustainable farms are usually smaller, they conserve water, they conserve energy, they use eco-friendly packaging. Um, it's, you know, as I had mentioned, it's not officially government regulated, it's fairly, a fairly new concept in the food industry. But what they do is they look to have a lot less of an impact on the environment 
um, with the, the way that they, they grow their food. Um, if you are, when you do eat some meat, you know, really trying to find some sustainably raised meat can really go a, a long way just in terms of um, humane. Um, and also what's really interesting is that, the, that these type of sustainably raised meat can potentially um, be carbon neutral. And so some really interesting studies because of the way that, that they're raised. Um, so if you're looking to, if you're questioning that and you're looking to, you know, have a conversation about it and learn more about it, there's a really, really great book. It's called The Sacred Cow. Um, and there, it's also a movie, I think, on Prime. And here it's the case um, for better and why well-raised meat is good for, for you and good for the planet. Um, I found it a really, really interesting thing. You know, somebody here had interesting book, somebody had said, everybody wants the same thing, to maximize human nutrition while minimizing animal suffering and harm to the environment. Um, the sacred cow describes the best way to achieve these goals. So, you know, if your budget allows, when you're buying from things like Walden Farms, Wild Pastures, um, you know, Neiman Farms, these are type of farms that are really, you know, using the, the local pasture raised meat that can be sustainable. Um, so check out that book. Uh, the other thing that we kind of want to think about is, you know, as we're looking to eat this whole plant-based diet is, you know, eliminating these ultra processed foods. These ultra processed foods are cheaply grown, um, are not good for us, are not good for our gut microbiome and, um, you know, use a lot of these kind of GMO type of ingredients and uh, these big, huge monocrop farms. Uh, number three, if you are eating some seafood, being picky about the type of seafood that you're eating. Um, and one of the really amazing foods that um, can really be sustainable is um, to filter water and to help uh, mussels because the way they're grown, um, they help to mitigate nutrient pollution. They help to remove carbon dioxide from the water to grow their shells because they need a lot of carbon for their shells. And farm mussels are zero input, meaning no fertilizers or food, which is kind of crazy, right? They, you just kind of stick them on. Um, they grow them on chains that grow down from boats. Um, and mussels, when we talk about having an amazing source of B12, as well as zinc, um, iron, and some other, the B vitamins, um, also can, you know, really, really amazingly, uh, not only delicious, but nutritious. Uh, if you're looking to get, you know, some best choices in terms of sustainable and also good for the environment, good for your health, um, this, these are the Monterey Bay Seafood Watch. Some of the best choices here are listed here. And surprisingly, some of the things that they list are actually farmed, right? Farmed mussels, farmed oysters, um, but as you can see, most of the stuff that's farmed is going to be the, the bivalves. Um, you do here have farm trout, but um, and then they give you some good alternatives and then here are the things to avoid as well. Um, they do have uh, an app that you can put on your phone so that you can take with you to the grocery store. Um, number four then of course would be to buy local as much as possible, right? So that you're not transporting the food across huge amounts of uh, distance, huge distance. Shop local farmers markets, look for signs in the stores. So when you go to the grocery store in the middle of summer, it's nice, you know, they have all the little local stuff, signs that say local, even in the big chain grocery stores. So, you know, the more that you support these types of things, the more that they are going to be round and, and, and grow. Um, you know, buy in season. So um, actually, I'm just noticing here, this is the fall one. So what would be in season now? So now we're starting to get things like strawberries that are in season and asparagus. And honestly, here in New England, they're not coming from New England. They're still traveling a little bit of a distance, but pretty soon we'll be getting more of the fresh lettuces that are gonna be grown here locally. And um, we'll start to see some things that are more local as well. Um, number six would be to reduce food waste, right? 
Food production has a huge environmental impact and about a third of the food produced ends up in the landfill. So when you waste food, you waste all the energy in the water that it takes to grow, harvest, transport, and package it. And if, if food goes to landfill and rots, it produces methane, um, which is a greenhouse gas, even more potent than carbon dioxide. So um, no bueno, right? So what can you do to reduce food waste? Um, I'm a huge proponent of freezing stuff. So if I make dinner and we have some, you know, maybe just one portion left over that I know I can't feed the whole family next day with one portion, I'll throw it in the freezer and it makes it so nice to pull it out and have lunch ready to go. Um, store smarter, meaning, you know, don't store, um, for example, uh, foods that re release a lot of ethylene, like apples and pears, you know, right next to other foods that, you know, it's going to cause to ripen more quick, quickly. Dress your um, leftovers up in glass containers. You make, make a soup or a casserole with some of your kitchen scraps, like, you know, the little odds and ends that you cut off of vegetables. Um, you go through your, your drawer and your um, vegetable drawer in your fridge and look and see what needs to be used up, make a soup on it. Um, take some leftovers, add an egg to it. We'll always make it kind of a new meal. Um, you know, pay attention to expiration dates. The sell by and use by dates are really for the store so that they can manage their inventory. So it's not hard and fast that you have to absolutely, you know, one day over the use by date that you have to use it. Um, you know, certainly you want to keep food safety in mind, but things like milk are good for tech, usually five to seven days past the sell by date if you keep it cold. Canned foods um, are good for up to five years, potentially after their use by date. Um, chicken and ground meat. Now this is one place where you don't wanna fool around. This is one to two days after purpose. When you grind meat, you're really increasing the surface area and more likely to be exposed to bacteria. Eggs also have a surprisingly long shelf life, um, properly handled, meaning refrigerated, et cetera. Um, they're still good for five weeks after the sell by date. Um, and yes, the stats for almond milk being good for five to seven days is, is also true for the almond milk as well. You know, and use your best judgment. If, you know, maybe you had it sitting out on the counter for a while, um, then I wouldn't, I wouldn't chance it. But if you're properly storing it, it's been cold the whole time and you're adhering to some of those food safety practices, um, you know, within reason, using your best judgment, uh, you can still use it. What's interesting is that people used to deliberately use sour milk for baking, right? So a lot of old old time baking recipes call for sour milk. And this is what you did when your milk got sour, you actually used it um, to bake with. Um, Food Link is a really great uh, charity that uh, it correlates and uh, um, uh, volunteers and organizes them to rescue fresh food um, that might otherwise get thrown out. Um, and then they, they deliver it to the community. Um, so far, 1 million plus pounds of food were saved from the landfill and they just won an EPA award. So um, they're actually here in Arlington. They have a location here. So if you're looking for a charity to support or, or volunteer at, um, you know, they, they are truly making a difference. Um, lastly, you know, reduce, reuse, repurpose, use washable cloths instead of paper towels, cut down or eliminate plastic cups, plastic utensils, buy less prepackaged foods, I mean, right? So buying less things that need a, need a package. Um, if you have a glass container, uh, like from jelly jar or a glass peanut butter jar, I always save them. And then you, they're a nice way to store leftovers, make some chia seed pudding, put them in the jars. Um, if you have, you know, a little bit of mustard left over in your glass jar, add in some olive oil and some vinegar, shake it around, and that can be, you know, your salad dressing and you use up all the rest of it. So, you know, just being smart about it. Um, all right, so that is the end of our presentation. Uh, I'm seeing here in the chat box, I think I got to everyone's comments, but somebody had said, uh, try to buy food in re recyclable containers to not styrofoam, absolutely. 
Um, and then going to the Q&A, somebody asked, why is yogurt and milk lower impact than cheese? Um, I, you know, I don't know the exact reason for that. Um, and I, 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 I would take a guess, I would hazard a guess that it actually takes a ton of milk to make cheese um, and possibly some heat and the way that cheese is made, maybe that's the reason why it has more of an impact um, because, because of that. So, um, ah. Thank you everyone for your kind words. Um, here I see somebody else said Blueberry Farm in Stratham, New Hampshire, chemical free veggies and berries. Oh, pick your own. Nice to know. Um, I love going to, to blueberry picking. Um, oh, okay. Somebody asked, can you please tell me the name of book, How to Store Food Again? Um, the name of the book was an Everlast. I think it was the book that was on the, um, it's called An Everlasting Meal. I'm going to put it in the chat box to everyone. Um, I think that's the book that you're talking about. So the two books that I had listed there were Everlasting Meal, and that's the one on how to use up leftovers and reduce food waste. Um, and it's really kind of a cool book. It's, it's almost written as not poetry. Um, it's just kind of a really cool book. It, I, I don't even know how you would describe it again. Um, how to reduce food waste, but she has a lot of some good recipes. Um, and uh, so that's good to use. Let me see somebody else. Um, oh yeah, had about sour milk. I'm seeing here salsa jars are great for reuse. The wide jars that are easy to clean. Oh yeah, that's a good tip too. Um, yeah, salsa jars work very well. And the other book that was mentioned as well um, was The Sacred Cow. I'm gonna put that in the chat box as well. And so the author of that is actually a dietitian and she always says it's, it's the how, not the cow, meaning it's how the cow is raised. Um, so it's, it's a very interesting book. Um, all right, I'm going to go ahead and say goodbye because we're out of time and it looks like um, we have all the um, questions answered. All right. Do you have any concerns over bacteria, et cetera, if you use lids or glass? Um, you mean if you use the lids that came with the jar? Um, not quite sure. You know, I would say always, you know, if you're reusing the glass jars, obviously just wash it like you would any other type of contain food container, right? And um, you want to make sure that you're using good food safety practices, no matter what, what you're using. Um, so, okay. Um, thank you, everyone, and we'll see you later.